David Stern actually had to do a preliminary coin toss. The Portland Trailblazers GM won that coin toss to make the actual call, but then he lost the subsequent flip heartbreaking to say the least I guess because that then gave Houston the ultimate upper hand in terms of making that first selection which would turn out to be a Kim Elijah one. Pretty rough week for the Portland Trailblazers back in 1984. They, <laughs> they pick up a, a quarter of a million dollar fine from the NBA for tampering and then also lose the coin toss. I always like to say that Michael got to play with me for a year at North Carolina. <laughs> I think it really helped him. Spectacular player from the beginning. You can see right away Jordan was going to be a big-time scorer and showed what an impact he was going to have on the league. This is NB85, celebrating the 30-year anniversary of Michael Jordan's rookie season in the NBA. And now, your hosts, Adam Ryan and Aaron Steen. Welcome back to the show, Aaron. Adam, let's get stuck into episode two, mate. 1984, pre-NBA draft. Let's quickly chat about... Late May of 1984, we did mention in our previous episode about the NBA postponing the original coin flip, which would decide who picked first in the 1984 NBA draft. Now, it was actually put off because of alleged indirect but illegal contact that the Portland Trailblazers apparently made with Hakeem Olajuwon and Patrick Ewing, and David Stern actually fined the Trailblazers two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for that contact. So that was really interesting. And what actually ended up happening was the proposed coin flip was then put back to May the twenty third. At that particular time, the coin toss decided which team picked first, and the Pacers had the East's worst record at that time, but the Blazers actually acquired Indiana's first-round pick from a 1981 trade where the Blazers gave up a young journeyman center named Tom Owens. So therefore, the teams with the two worst records, which were Houston and Portland, had the coin flip. But because both teams wished to make the decisive call on the coin flip, David Stern actually had to do a preliminary coin toss. The Portland Trailblazers GM won that coin toss to make the actual call, but then he lost the subsequent flip, which was uh, obviously heartbreaking to say the least, I guess, because that then gave Houston the ultimate upper hand in terms of making that first selection, which would turn out to be a Kim Elijah one. Pretty rough week for the Portland Trailblazers back in 1984. <laughs> they, they pick up a, a quarter of a million dollar fine from the NBA for tampering uh, and then also lose the other coin toss, mate. Um, and it's funny that the Trailblazers picked up the draft choice from Indiana because it may have been Indiana that was the other butt of jokes over the last 30 years over selecting Sam Bowie in that draft, but who knows who they would have picked, I guess. That's right, just with the ramshackle nature of the draft and how things – ramshackle, I don't think I've ever used that word uh, – just the whole nature of the draft – how things work out after the first few picks and the old what-if scenarios. It's amazing what could have transpired. What we'll be chatting about today in Episode 2 will cover from – that period of time right through till conclusion of the 84 NBA draft. I'll kick off with an article that I discovered, which is from June the 5th, and it's titled Pros Consider Draft Picks. In that article, the Portland Trailblazers coach, Jack Ramsey, he was quoted as saying, we more desperately need a center. In the same article, the Bulls assistant coach, Bill Blair, he was quoted as saying, we'll take one of two players, either Bowie or Jordan. So by this stage, of course, Houston had that first pick and they had every intention to select Elijah one. But I thought it was uh, interesting to note that even given all the praise that Jordan received in the lead up to the NBA draft, and of course, being one of the linchpins of the Olympic team itself, he was still selected behind both Elijah one and Bowie, which just suggested, of course, the absolute need for legitimate big guys in the NBA at that particular time. And even with the other yeah, Bulls loving Jordan so much at that time, the thought of those centres being available at one or two was definitely still on the mind of the, the front office of the Bulls. And it mentioned that the Bulls needed a centre at that time. And apparently, as did everyone in uh, 1984, because I'll probably end up sounding a bit like a broken record, but just the level of importance you know, for teams to have a super centre in that day, even now, like, yeah, I read it and I find it incredible. We know that the Bulls obviously selected Michael Jordan at pick number three, but the Dallas Mavericks at pick number four and the 76ers, who were pick number five respectively, they were both obviously very interested in selecting Jordan as well. Rick Sund, who is a guy that we'll be chatting about a bit more in this episode as well, he was the Mavs director of player personnel at the time. He was quoted as saying that they'd take Jordan in a second if he fell to number four, but 
obviously Chicago was locked in and went with MJ. This is one of the many mentions throughout these articles of Rick Sund and his very high opinion of Jordan at the time. He said that they were hoping for either Sam Perkins or Mel Turpin, but if Jordan fell to number four, they'd, they'd definitely take him. He also went on to say in that article that Michael would be an all-pro player. So, yeah, obviously one of the guys who was outwardly high on MJ as a, a prospect coming into the draft. The article then also said that uh, Dallas also needed a centre, surprise, surprise, but also stated that that Roe Blackman was already there at the two-guard spot if selecting Jordan were to become a possibility. And in saying that the Mavs needed a centre, the article then pushed Pat Cummings and Curtin Infus under the bus as the two existing Mavs pivot men. And I actually had a look at their numbers and Pat Cummings had averages the year before in the 84 season of 13 and 8 and Curtin Infus was... At seven and six, so I guess like Pat Cummings in particular had had decent numbers, but uh, yeah, apparently every team needed to have Kareem uh, in their squad. Um, <laughs> again, the emphasis on big men. Yeah, and Pat Cummings as well. I remember him most from his days with the New York Knicks, which would be yeah. beyond this nineteen eighty five season that we're chatting about. There was a game from Jordan's rookie year that you may or may not have sent me at some point in time <laughs> uh, where MJ has, has 42 at, at MSG and Pat Cummins is on the Knicks squad in that game. I'm sure that you'll remember that. I remember him as a Knicks, so that would make perfect sense. There's a few more points as well from that same article that I think you wanted to elaborate on a bit more too. Yes, uh, Pat Williams from the 76ers who were picking at the number five slot said... Jordan would be long gone by the time they pick and they hadn't even discussed him, which I find hard to believe. But if you take out the big man factor of that era, you'd think that MJ would have gone first overall with his star was skyrocketing by this stage and the Olympics were said to they were going to make his markability even better. So I think that a lot of the things that I've read about MJ and about how highly he was regarded coming out of college, I think that if you take out the you know, importance on having a centre that he would have gone first. At the end of the article, the uh, the guys, I think it was time for a cold shower because they, <laughs> they started really gushing over Jordan a little bit in the article. They were saying how he would look as good in the red and white of the Bulls as he did in the blue and white at UNC it was quite entertaining and I felt the need to try to bring that up. It was uh, slapping me in the face. <laughs> and, and Bill Blair, you mentioned him before, the assistant coach for the Bulls called MJ close to a can't miss. So they were definitely high on him. Uh, and he said that they'd take even MJ or, or Sam Bowie. On the 14th of June, Jerry Hooks wrote an article called Jordan's Draft is June 19. And he spoke of Houston picking Kim Olajuwon and Paulin picking... Sam Bowie. It was reported in the article by Hooks that the that the 76ers wanted MJ in a trade for the fifth pick, Andrew Tony and Clement Johnson. MJ had been playing in pickup games at Carmichael Auditorium with other former Tar Heels, including James Weathy, who would return to finish his degree that summer. And then he also got married at that time. Uh, and he also mentioned that in the 1984 NBA Finals, which were happening at around that time, uh, that the, the finals had five players with North Carolina connections. 1984, Team USA Olympic Training Camp. From that article that you're just talking about there as well, mate, we're only into the first couple of episodes, but one of the really cool things that I've enjoyed already is finding out more of an exact timeline about where Jordan was at this particular stage of his career. So even though his UNC season had ended and it was leading up to the Olympics in the couple of weeks gap where the mini camp had finished in mid-May and then the training camp opened up for mid-June, we can still track some of the things that MJ did in terms of, and as you mentioned in that article there, it says he was playing some pickup games at Carmichael Auditorium, so he was hanging around North Carolina still in Chapel Hill and uh, obviously honing his game in the lead-up to the draft and and the resumption of the uh, Olympic trials process, which is pretty cool. Yeah, he had a spare couple of weeks, obviously, but he was still pretty busy. There's another article that I'd like to chat about for a moment. It's titled, Person Hoping to Make Team. Now, I'm pretty sure it's not referring to just any sort of person. It's talking about Chuck Person from June the 15th, and that was coincidentally the same day that the USA Olympic training camp reopened at Bloomington, Indiana. In this article, uh, it's a good read about Chuck Person, and it just details his rise from being an unknown high school junior to becoming one of the final 20 to take part at those 1984 Olympic trials. And he'd eventually be named an alternate 
in case of injury before the mid-July roster deadline with Team USA. I thought that was pretty interesting to read about Chuck Person, who was largely unheralded, I guess, in his first season at Auburn, but then came on strong in his second season and beyond that, leading to his draft pick in 1986. Yes, it's really quite interesting to see the amount of players that almost came out of nowhere during these trials. And they're all all names that we know very well now, of course, in 2014. Chuck Person's one of them. Mm -hmm. The 15th was when Team USA training camp opened at Bloomington, Indiana. The 1984 draft would take place on June the 19th. And then the USA would embark on a multi-game exhibition series against one college alumni team and the remainder versus NBA stars, and that'll be the focus of episode three of NB85. 1984, pre-NBA draft. Just more of uh, an NBA bit from that time. On the, the 16th of June, the Milwaukee Sentinel wrote about the NBA file suit and seeks to replace the LA Clippers. The NBA actually filed suit to terminate the Clippers after they moved to LA without legal approval. Now, the first question that hit me in the head was, how does a team relocate without approval from the league? (laughs) Uh, And it makes you wonder if even at this point in time, well-known pain in the neck of the NBA, Donald Sterling, what influence he had on that unsanctioned move and the other subsequent fine that they got from the NBA. I think on track with the other Clippers of that day, the article also mentioned that Terry Cummings said he, and I quote, wouldn't mind a trade from the Clippers. Uh, and this was also at the time when Elgin Baylor was offered a prominent front office position by the Clippers, which he would be fired from, which ended in a very well-publicized discrimination lawsuit against Donald Sterling in 2009, Adam. When I came across that article, I was quite bemused, really, because I couldn't really find much more else about it. But you're spot on when you say... How does a team relocate without approval from the league in the first instance? So it was a bizarre set of circumstances, and it even mentioned uh, briefly about the fact that the NBA might try and have a new franchise still remain in San Diego. And yeah, it was quite baffling, to be honest, but that was an interesting piece of news, which I, I definitely thought was newsworthy, which is why it was included in our discussion today. And there is a, a further article which is titled, Rockets Expect to Make Elijah on First Pick, which appeared in newspapers on June the 17th, and as well as detailing again the fact that David Stern fined the Trailblazers $250,000 for the illegal indirect contact with Akeem Olajuwon and Patrick Ewing before the draft. It also said that Philadelphia owned the fifth pick in 84, which we alluded to earlier in this chat, due to a trade that took place with San Diego dating back to October of 1978. That just sort of proves the fact that all these little, and I think I used the word ramshackle, which is probably not even the right word, but it just shows. I think it's accurate though. Yeah. Because, you know, it's again, the other Clippers, regardless of which city that they're in and just the stink that they had on them you know, in the 80s and 90s. Mm. All these sort of things impacted a future time. So dating back almost six years, a decision that they made then gave another team a chance to draft a future Hall of Famer. Again, it just shows the amount of uh, things that anything they touched pretty much turned to, I don't, I'm not sure what the polite word to say is, but it didn't go down well for the Clippers. Houston's Ray Patterson, who I believe was the uh, director of player personnel for the Rockets at the time, um, said that weeks prior to this point that the Rockets were actually looking for help at forward and guard. Then they won you know, a certain coin toss, and I guess that changed his mind. The column also stated that MJ was also leaving college early, but Elijah one is the biggest prize. I find it amazing that Houston had the number one pick the other year before, got Ralph Sampson, who was also good enough to win Rookie of the Year, but still finished last in the West. The season before they picked up Sampson, they were in the mid-teens in terms of, of wins, yeah. wins for the season, and then I think they went up to maybe 29 wins in 83-84, which then still gave them one of the worst records in the league to then have the chance again to pick up the number one pick in the draft. Everything seemed to fall into place for them getting their initial lineup of the Twin Towers. And the aforementioned fifth pick that the 76ers had, they said that they would probably pick Charles Barkley, though Washington, who had the number six pick, were also interested in Charles um, and spoke about how Charles would make a physically imposing front line in Washington with Jeff Ruland and Rick Mahorn, both of which, ironically enough, would be two future teammates of Charles's in Philadelphia, Adam. 
This is NB85. I'm actually going to jump ahead for a minute, mate, and talk about an article that I read in our research, which was from June the 19th, and this one is a classic. It's titled, Predicting First Round Draft Picks, A Guess Past Top 3. In amongst other things, it does say the following statement, which sums up the 1984 draft really well. It'll be hard to miss on the first three, but the rest can be based only on team need, availability, and scouting reports. Now, in the same article, there's two classic assessments <laughs> One of Charles Barkley and the other of Mel Turpin, who were the fifth and sixth picks respectively, as you just mentioned. On Charles, it says, uncommon combination of quickness, leaping ability, and rotundity. (laughs) Rotundity. (laughs) Rotundity, which I was staggered when I read that word. It was fantastic. (laughs) I went straight to the the thesaurus, and some of the words it gave as synonyms were quite kind in their description of what the word meant. And then the further down the list it went with synonyms, it said something like plumpness, uh, and other 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 words to do with being uh, overweight, things like that. So I just found that absolutely hilarious. And then in relation to Mel Turpin, it says <laughs> bullets may have to impose a calorie cap in, in addition to a salary cap if they take Turpin or Barkley to team with massive Jeff Rule and, and Rick Mahorn. So what a fantastic article. I'd love to know the actual author of that particular piece. I don't think I could track it down. I just knew the article name and the date. Fantastic stuff. And the the Charles Barkley weight and size size comments just uh, continue to flow through. It, obviously, <laughs> they were that taken aback by his size, but also his, his ability to get up and down the court that, you know, they couldn't believe it because, yeah, as I mentioned in episode one, the amount of times that his size and weight is mentioned is uh, is incredible. There was a an article on June the 17th, which spoke about the, uh, the very famous five-star camp for high school players. Uh, I've just recently read past a point in Roland Lazenby's new book, Michael Jordan, The Life, which portrayed how little known uh, Michael Jordan was when he went to that camp and the exposure that it gave him through his play. He attended it and really shot the prominence just before his senior season at Laney. Uh, and to quote MJ, he said that that five-star camp was the turning point in his life. So it really was a, uh, a very important stage in MJ's rise to a prominence before he got to North Carolina. And that would be something which would be just fascinating if any footage does finally surface of that particular time and just some raw footage of Jordan playing as a high school junior or senior. That really was what first got everyone talking about him. If that could actually appear at some stage in the future, who knows? Because it seems that with every passing week or month, some new rare Jordan footage does emerge. So you can only hope that uh, somebody had the foresight to perhaps record and film something from that era as well. The, uh, the recount that Roland gave in his book really uh, highlighted just how, how dominant um, MJ was, particularly on the defensive end. He was, I think, before he came to, to North Carolina, he was rated as a better defensive player than an offensive player. But he was rated that high as a defensive player that I think he was still regarded to be very good at the other end of the court. But yeah, the camp really shot him to prominence. And it was at this time uh, that the pro scouts were dubbing Jordan to be a certainty to become a superstar, which again shows that he was regarded as a sure thing for the NBA, but the Trailblazers still went with that unknown quantity you know, of Sam Bowie, who had sat out two seasons uh, at college previous to this point with you know, his leg problems just because he was a centre. There's another article which appeared on June the 19th, mate, which is called Stockton Jazzed at Utah's Choice. Now, credit straight away to whoever came up with that title. I love a good play on words and puns, so well done to them. This must have been printed in the afternoon or evening on the day of the NBA draft itself. It has a good rundown of most of the first round selections and surprise picks. It also notes that all eight of the Olympians who were eligible for the draft were taken in the first 18 picks. The Olympic squad, obviously a very, very strong squad. And you you mentioned John Stockton before. He was uh, apparently, uh, and it's reported that he was very, very upset that he missed out on on selection for the other final twelve man squad. In Roland Lazenby's book, Michael Jordan: The Life, it spoke about how an angry Stockton told Carl Malone and Charles Buckley, who were also uh, not selected for the final twelve man squad, said he'd love to team up with them to take on the twelve that they. They selected for the game, so he obviously felt that the ability of the players who weren't selected was easily up to that of the uh, the other 12-man squad. 
On the, the 19th of June, the Kentucky New Era had a draft prediction um, and in this column, pretty close. They actually had no John Stockton at all in their first round. So there was definite surprise uh, when Utah used the other 16th pick on him uh, as the experts all figured that the Jazz would take local star, the aforementioned Devin Durant. On the 19th of June, the Star News had player sketches or, or profiles on the other players taken in the draft. And it said that MJ was, and I quote, an aggressive defender with great leaping ability. There's an article in here, mate, that I actually hadn't brought up that I'd be chatting about, but it's called Elijah Wan's Parents Have Worries Over Son's Education, Not Draft, which was also from the Kentucky New Era on the 19th of June. And it does note that Elijah Wan visited his native country of Nigeria earlier in the month of June, and he found out that his parents weren't completely sold on him becoming a professional basketball player. It actually made mention that his family owned a cement business in Lagos, it was fair to say that Elijah Mon was pretty concrete in his decision to turn pro. <laughs> <laughs> on the list of responses, uh, the, yeah, the next one that I had on the list was <laughs> Stone Cold Silence, so that's why you got the Stone Cold. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I thought that was quite good. Eddie here. It was good, man. No, I enjoyed it. All right, so... <clears throat> you go looking for these puns, don't you? You're like I do. Yeah. I do. I couldn't help myself. Like, I mean, there is no point in mentioning that Elijah Wan's family had a concrete business, but you are just rock solid on these puns, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the cracks are starting to appear, mate. That's all I can say. So, there was an article on June the 20th, which is titled, NBA Draft Underlines Strength of US Olympic Team. Now, this was a really great article that I was very happy to find in my search for discussion topics before this project even got underway and it has a great opening sentence in the article it begins by saying if you were wondering about the caliber of the u.s olympic basketball team that coach bobby knight has under construction in bloomington indiana the national basketball association draft should ease your concerns now it alludes to the fact that all eight of team usa's players who are eligible for the draft were selected inside the first 18 picks and it continues by saying that is a ringing endorsement by the pros of the talent Knight has assembled to go for the gold in Los Angeles. So I thought that was a really fantastic read and that'll be one of the numerous articles that we've touched on in this episode that will appear on the website as well, mate. Two of the current NBA players of the day who were mentioned on more than one occasion in trade scenarios and or in Terry Cummings' case, he's pleading for a trade away from the Clippers were Julius Irving and uh, and Terry Cummings. There was an article in the Toledo Blade on the 21st of June saying 76ers reject Irving deal. It was spoken that Julius Irving and picks 10 and 26 uh, were to go to San Diego for Terry Cummings, but the 76ers rejected the other uh, trade. And uh, I think I've mentioned before that at the time, the other uh, doctor was, was 34 years of age. The fantastic 1984 draft documentary, which recently aired on NBA TV, spoke of a possible uh, Dr. J for MJ trade that the other uh, Sixers proposed to the Bulls. One of the, of the articles also spoke of the other uh, 76ers need to replace the 34-year-old Dr. J, who clearly wasn't too far away from retirement. So to offer Dr. J up in a trade for the other number three pick in the draft and the 1984 NCAA Player of the Year, I'd find it hard to believe that the Sixers actually did this, considering how lopsided that the trade would have been uh, and considering Julius Irving's age, and even if they did, surely Rod Thorne gave it zero for it at the time. The 76ers were drawing a very long bow to be able to suggest that as a possible trade, of course. Uh, wishful thinking and then some, I guess, for the, the doctor at that stage. But he did go on until, I think, 1987 was his last season. Got bundled out in the playoffs by the uh, Milwaukee Bucks. And we'll also get to that great documentary, mate, as well, the 84 draft. We'll chat about that in a little bit as well, just some of our thoughts about that fantastic NBA TV documentary too. There's a couple more articles you'd like to touch on there, mate. Yes, Greg Stoder, uh, who I mentioned before, after the point that Jordan had been selected by the Bulls and he was going to be playing his pro ball in, in Chicago, he wrote an article called Jordan Might Own a City. The, the Bulls were in dire need of MJ's zest. Uh, they hadn't made the playoffs since 1975. 
yeah, the Bulls wouldn't keep their entire guard rotation because uh, I believe with Jordan they had five or six guards in, in the rotation so they let Mitchell Wiggins go at that time. Michael was described as enthusiastic, positive thinker with a happy disposition and Greg wrote that Chicago had been aching for another star in the mold of football legend Walter Payton. Greg wrote that he was unsure if Jordan would commit to a long-term deal, and he subsequently signed a seven-year, $6 million deal. <laughs> but I think the the plus side of that deal was, obviously, it was great financially for the Bulls, given the fact that they locked him down for seven years and that amount of money. But one of the reasons why Jordan was happy with that deal was the fact that he added in a clause to the contract which is forever known as the love of the game clause as well so it suited both parties really when you think about it that way it was a deal at the time actually that was with a bit of controversy because uh, even at that time in 1984 nba player salaries were on the increase and i think a lot of people figured that by the time that seventh year rolled around that with his current deal that he'd be underpaid so a lot of people were unsure if it was even a smart deal for them to sign just one more thing on that. With the exception of Jordan's 1997 and 1998 seasons where he earned mega bucks, and we're talking like you know $30 million a season or thereabouts, he'd never earned more than $4 million per season, which was, dare I say, staggering. Uh, obviously, he earned it and then some in those two seasons where the Bulls came to the party and gave him those incredible deals. But of course, his off-court endorsements obviously was where he made the bulk of his money and his fame anyhow. Incredible to think that he never earned more than $4 million in pretty much all but two of his NBA seasons. Even when he came back with the Wizards, and yes, that did really happen, he only earned the league minimum. And I think in the first season in 2001, 2002, he actually donated that to the victims of September 11. So just a few little random stats there for you, mate. He played for the Wizards? I read about it. I actually haven't seen any footage to back this up. Yeah, I have no recollection of that. Not, not many not many people <laughs> Do, but I, I quite enjoyed it. But anyhow, that's another topic for another time, I'm sure. We can probably put a uh, seven-part series out about his wizard career as well. It was also spoken about how when he, he took his sabbatical in 1993 and went and played baseball, that Jerry Reinsdorf actually continued to pay him his contract, his uh, annual salary from the Bulls, which I guess he's not playing for the Bulls. It's quite generous of Jerry Reinsdorf to do that, but I think he owed it to him anyway. So For sure, he earned that and then some. This episode should actually be prefaced by the fact that we have discussed the 1984 draft itself in some depth in a previous episode of the In All Enders podcast, episode number 25. So if you want to have a listen to inallenders.com slash 25, there's a bit more shameless self-promotion. You'll be able to have a listen to Aaron and I, and we chat about the entire 84 draft, mate. Our episode recording took place well in advance of NBA TV borrowing, inverted commas, our idea and turning it into a TV special. I'm still waiting for the uh, royalty checks to come through from the NBA because clearly it was our idea. Exactly right. We did it back in, when did we do the episode? When we did record that, I've just had a quick look back in the old archives, we released it on June the 17th of 2013, so only two days prior to when the draft took place in 1984, so 29 years almost to the day is when we recorded that episode and released it. NBA TV, The 84 Draft. It premiered on June the 9th of 2014. Just a few thoughts about that show in general there, mate. You've obviously had a chance to see it since. Um, I, I thought it was just fantastic stuff. One of the things that, and it's not really a criticism, it's just the fact that I've seen so much Michael Jordan footage. There actually wasn't really any new Jordan footage of note that I hadn't already seen either via YouTube or any other sort of means as well. But there were some other great, incredible footage from the archives that they did use. And one of the highlights for me was seeing Charles Barkley as a college player talking about his own nicknames and actually having graphics on the screen that listed each nickname as he went through them, which I thought was was absolutely fantastic. You mentioned before about not a lot of new Jordan footage. I think you and I spoke about this um, earlier on in that it was a lot of the same footage, but I think that even the, uh, the documentary had that same footage, but maybe extended it by a few seconds, because I do remember seeing like some extra bits on existing footage that I've already seen, but I think you're right, not a lot of new footage in general, mate. Especially in relation to Jordan, there was some other stuff from the archives that I'd never seen before, and that was a real delight to be able to see that sort of stuff. And uh, it was also really good to, to see Stockton as well, when he chatted about his honest assessment of how he even thought he'd never play in the NBA. He was legitimately talking about going pro in Europe and actually heading overseas to play in Europe. He didn't even entertain for whatever reason. I guess he was just a very humble 
young guy thinking that he wouldn't have a chance to show his wares in the NBA. And of course, he'd go on to have an incredible Hall of Fame career. So I thought that was a really interesting take as well. And uh, it was just good to see a different side of Stockton. Of course, he's quite a private person. You don't get to see a lot about him. So I thought that was really interesting. Uh, There are some other characters that we really got to see some more information about and learn plenty more about, including Rick Carlisle. I really enjoyed the feature about him and, and his link to the Celtics and being drafted at pick number 70 overall and then how he became you know, an integral part of the Celtics franchise and then went on to obviously enjoy being an NBA champion and being so close with Larry Bird. So just the sort of steps that fell into place for that to even take place. There was some really good archival footage I showed of him. So that was really enjoyable. And another character as well who didn't actually play in the NBA was Brazilian legend Oscar Smith. Now he was picked at number 131 by the Nets, never played in the NBA. For me, he actually almost he almost stole the show. He was fantastic. He was such a character, really funny and just open and honest. And I, I loved seeing the footage about him. One of the other great great things about the documentary, I think, mate, is the fact that it, it covers off the other main guys. You know, it covers off Jordan, Elijah, Juan Barkley, uh, and whatnot. But it also featured very prominently three guys that you wouldn't have expected like, to see in the documentary. Rick Carlisle, of course, who's the other current head coach of the other Dallas Mavericks, not very, not overly well known for his his, uh, his playing career. Oscar Schmidt, who obviously had a an amazing international career, but as you mentioned, he never played in the NBA. So another strange guy put a feature in the '84 draft documentary, and I guess the uh, the third guy that you're going to speak about, I guess, was one of the more more stunning stories from the documentary, Adam. It was equal parts fantastic, but also tragic as well. It was a heartbreaking story about Dan Trent, who was the last guy selected in the draft at number 228 by the Boston Celtics as well. He was a a victim of the 9-11 terrorist attacks and just an incredibly smart way that they they wove that story from the draft, showing some, some great footage of him from his, I think, high school and college career. And then what he achieved overseas as well. I think he was a star in Ireland was where they were showing that he was a a really well-known and famous player. And then just the tragedy of being in the wrong place at the wrong time after his pro career had obviously ended and then being in the World Trade Center in the September 11 attack. So as I said, a really heartbreaking story of loss there that um, was beautifully woven into the story. It was a, an excellent piece of, of storytelling there at the end and definitely brought a, a tear to my eye when I saw it. Very uh, emotional emotional story about Dan Trent. Just as a quick comparison, mate, for each of the Rockets, Blazers and Bulls 1984 NBA seasons compared to how they fared following the 1985 NBA seasons, I've got a quick comparison of some of their win-loss records over that time from one season to the next. The Rockets went from 29 and 53 to 48 and 34 in 1985 so they were plus 19 in the win column with Akeem as a rookie the Blazers went from 48 and 34 they went down minus 6 to 42 and 40 when Bowie was a rookie that seems fitting yeah unfortunately I guess because the Blazers were already 48 and 34 and they just happened to luck into the coin toss to get the first pick it wasn't much of a difference and he didn't contribute nearly as much as I guess they would have hoped and also the Bulls went from 27 and 55 in 1984 to a still sub 500, 38 and 44, but it was still plus 11 and good enough for the eighth spot in the Eastern Conference playoff race as well. So Jordan, of course, was the Rookie of the Year, but just some of the key stats from each of those individual guys, Akeem Olajuwon averaged over 20 points, almost 12 boards, one and a half assists and close to three blocks a game in 35 and a half minutes a contest. He played all 82 games. Sam Bowie averaged 10 points, 8.6 boards, almost three assists, which is quite good. Almost three blocks as well, which is very good. He had good numbers. He had good numbers in his rookie year. And in times when he was actually healthy, both in college and in the NBA, yeah, his numbers were quite decent. Yeah, that's it. And that's one of the things about his game that gets overlooked. He's often referred to as, you know, one of the biggest bust draft picks, but he did put up some good numbers when actually healthy. So that sort of does hide his value to the team and teams he played on as well. So he played in 76 of the 82 games in his rookie season, so that's pretty good overall in terms of his health. And Jordan averaged just over 28 a game, six and a half boards, almost six assists and two and a half steals in just under 39 minutes a game. And of course, he played all 82 regular season games and they made it to the playoffs as well. 
And Jordan, as a rookie, led the Bulls in, I think, every major statistical category as well. Great numbers all around. Roland Lazenby's book, Michael Jordan, The Life. At the moment, you are in the midst of reading Roland Lazenby's book. You've alluded to it a couple of times, Michael Jordan, The Life. I'm hoping to receive a copy of the book in the coming weeks, uh, all going well. And I've been quite jealous of the fact that you've had it there at your house and you're going through that in some depth. There's a couple of things from that book that you'd like to chat about as well. And then I might just add a few other comments on the back of that too. Yeah, I'm also looking forward to you getting your copy so I don't have to take photographs and send them through to you so you can you can <laughs> that, you can read the book. <laughs> that never happened, Roland. It never happened. May or may not have happened. Thank you. Just to elaborate a bit more on the the, the Bulls situation as a team and as a franchise, you know, at the time when Jordan was was drafted by them, I read it the state that they were in and just marveled at the talk about a change of fortune for a team because Roland wrote of the disappointing drafts that the Bulls had endured uh, in previous years to 1984, starting with the lost coin toss in 1979 that led to them drafting David Greenwood at number two and the Lakers ending up with Irvin Magic Johnson. Jeff Perlman, who's um, recently released a fantastic book about the 1980s Showtime Lakers called, strangely enough, Showtime said that the magic mentioned if the Bulls had have won the coin toss that he would have stayed at Michigan State. Such was the state of the Bulls at the time. I don't think he was overly enamored with the uh, Chicago weather either. And in February of 1984, Rod Thorne traded fan favorite but well-known ball hog Reggie Thies <laughs> to the Kansas City Kings for Steve Johnson and a draft pick. And it was there that Chicago's team got worse and its luck got better as they finished at 27 and 55, missed the playoffs for the third straight year and fueled speculation that the team would be sold and moved. Several issues with players also brought the team very close to insolvency in the spring of 1984. So in the spring of 1984, the team almost goes bust and then along comes MJ. Like, you know, you couldn't script it any better than that. Yeah, I wasn't actually aware that Chicago was in such a dire Yeah, me either. Such a dire state that they were actually close to folding altogether as a franchise. So that was really interesting and another thing that I look forward to getting into when I actually get a copy of the book to have a look at. Erwin Mandel, a longtime Bulls vice president, said that when the Bulls saw Houston win the coin toss that allowed them to draft a team that they knew that Jordan would become a bull. They figured if Portland had have won the toss and gotten the first overall pick that they would have taken Elijah one and Houston would have drafted Jordan uh, with the other second pick, considering that they had Ralph Sampson already from the other previous year's draft. So as uh, I mentioned to you before, mate, you know, who knows, we may have all ended up being Houston Rockets fans at one point. And the president of the Michael Jordan fan club, Rick Sund, uh, had seen... <laughs> what Jordan was like when he played in, in college and he was that high on Mike that he offered the Bulls their young star at the time, Mark Aguirre, in a deal. Uh, Rick Sun said that Rod, as in Rod Thorne, didn't even waver. He knew. He knew exactly what they were getting in Jordan. A very, very cool insight to the, the other process at the time. Yep, now that's probably much more of a believable deal that was offered in terms of at least taking Mark Aguirre in return for giving up their pick because Aguirre was obviously a Chicago product and a, a star uh, at DePaul a, and a rising star, of course, in the NBA. Yeah, and 24 years old at the time as opposed to, to Julie Serving being 10 years his senior at 34. Yeah, exactly. So that's why it's a much more believable deal and, and one that I could actually fathom possibly being considered. But, of course, uh, you just did say that Rod Thorne, he didn't even waver. He just knew. And just one other thing we just mentioned there about Mark Aguirre, but another deal that I read about in the lead up to our chat today, which had since surfaced after we'd spoken about it in our 84 draft episode, Terry Cummings was actually offered to the Bulls in exchange for their third pick in a lead up to the 84 draft as well as one of the possible deals that was on offer as well. But Rod Thorne again said, thanks, but no thanks. So some interesting things that may have been again, based on the what if game as well, mate. But in the end, of course, Jordan was a bull and that's how we've ever known him, of course, in the annals of history. Do you recall in the Jordan rules, the story about Donald Sterling um, offering essentially the entire Clippers roster to the bulls for Jordan? <laughs> uh, look, I'd, 
I know vaguely what you're referring to, and I can't remember where or exactly how it was possibly offered, but I know that he... Uh, well, trust me, as far as context goes, that, that's all I've got for you. That's all I can remember. But I do recall yeah, Donald Sterling offering, I think it was by like five players, at least five players for MJ. I think it was in 89 or 90. I definitely remember it. I just don't know exactly the details behind it, but I know that he was effectively going to gut the franchise in order to lure Jordan away. And it was late 80s, I'm pretty sure. Um, I should really know, given that Sam Smith is a former guest on the podcast as well. And I've read the Jordan rules multiple times, but um, can't remember exactly. But I know it would have decimated the Clippers, although at, at that stage, would it really have mattered? Agreed. So a couple of the guys that we've mentioned throughout this conversation, mate, Sam Smith, author of the Jordan rules. He was a guest on episode 11 of the show and terry cummings also is a former guest of the podcast as well he was episode number 17 so we've also chatted about the 84 nba draft which was episode 25 so all that information will be in the show notes to this episode thanks again aaron for joining me for this episode and we will be back in the not too distant future for episode three sorry mate i'm actually a little busy right now researching for episode three giddy up Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show and share my web address with your friends and colleagues in allairness.com. Check out the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with high-profile guests. Follow me on Twitter at inallairness. Please add your like to the show's social hub, facebook.com slash inallairness. Join me next time for another edition of the show.